God grant us the wisdom and the courage and the patience to seek always after the truth, come whence it may, cost what it will. Amen. Amen. On the morning of May 25th, 1940, Hulda Ann Slack arrived at Manhattan's Grand Central Station on the New York Central Railroad's 20th Century Limited from Chicago. She was met by her fiance, John, Leroy Rapp, and his office buddy, Billy McLaughlin. Together, the trio walked the few blocks to the Episcopal Church of the Transfiguration, which was also known as the little church around the corner, where Anne and John were married in the rector's office. Billy was their witness. Got that? Now, fast forward 49 years. You couldn't make these things up. And I was offered the position of vicar of a small, struggling mission church in northwestern New Jersey. I went to visit the little parish and found it pretty depressing. The front doors of the church were nailed shut. You had to be an insider and know that to enter the building, you had to go down an alley and into a kitchen door, and through a kitchen door. The time of the Sunday service was incorrect on the front, the sign at the front of the church, but it didn't matter because you couldn't read the sign anyway, the paint was so chipped. I just about decided already to turn down the position, but I was there, so I thought not much to lose by going through the interview. And we enjoyed a nice dinner at a local restaurant, and I answered a lot of questions. And then a member of the search committee asked me if I had any questions for them. Tell me a little bit about your history, I asked, I answered. I've been told that you are a mission church and that you'd like to become a parish church, a self-sustaining parish. Well, someone said, a group of parishioners from a large and prosperous Manhattan church dearly wanted to get out of the stifling heat of the city in the summer, so they bought property here in northern New Jersey, and they bought a Sears Roebuck church kit. Did you know? Sears Roebuck really did sell churches. They shipped their church, their ch church here on the railroad hmm, to the country. And the group who wanted a summer church here began to attend locals, not just folks from Manhattan, 
And then we broke off from our city congregation, left the Diocese of New York, and joined the Diocese of Newark. What was the name of your founding church? I asked. You know the answer. The little church around the corner, someone said. And a chill went down my spine and just did again, just did again this moment. So you finally figured out by now that Anne and John were my parents who had been married at, in the rector's office of the little church around the corner, which is the nickname for Church of the Transfiguration. Had God been setting the stage for me? I don't believe those things. But something was going on. I was sure of that. I decided that if they could build a church out of a kit, they could probably unnail the front door. <laughs> and so I kept listening. And I learned lots and lots and lots in the eight years I served God in that small, wonderful little church in New Jersey. Some of those folks I'm still in touch with, thanks to Facebook. And we did become a self-sustaining parish. I might possibly understand the miracle of the transfiguration a little bit better now after preaching eight sermons on it. Then I understood it when I accepted that call 35 years ago. I know something now about standing on holy ground and hearing the voice of God. Not as a loud shout from a cloud, but, whoops. As a still, small voice, a nudge, an intuitive feeling, pointing, pulling, cajoling me, leading me down a road less traveled to a place I didn't think I wanted to go. What about you? Where and when have you heard the voice of God? Where is God leading you? If you're not able to hear the voice of God, why is that? There are so many other voices to listen to. How do we hear the voice of God? Where do you hear the voice of God? In this world with so many distractions, how do we hear the voice of God amongst all the choices? How do we hear the voice saying this? is my son. Listen to him. I know what the Synoptic Gospels 
report happened on that mountain. Jesus, the itinerant preacher, provocative leader, outsider's friend, becomes transfigured, his face glowing, and his clothes dazzling white. Moses representing the law, and Elijah, the prophets, appear with him. Peter offers to construct three booths so that the three leaders can stay. And a voice from God shouts, don't be a Unitarian, Peter. This is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. I understand that this event is a miracle, a supernatural manifestation, similar to Jesus' birth when angels are flying in the sky. How do I understand this with my post-Copernican, post-Freudian brain? How do we understand miracles? Do we even believe in miracles, supernatural occurrences? Hmm. Settings on mountaintops are presented as the point where humans meet God. They are meeting places, heaven and earth. Meeting places where Jesus is the connector. Then, now, eternally, I only know one way to hear God, and that is through faith. This is a story of faith. I only know, I've only known one way to meet and hear God. If you would, take your insert and read with me the collect of the day. O oh God, who on the holy mount revealed to chosen witnesses your beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment white and glistening. Mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty, who with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.